Five fun facts about being. Number one, being means different things in different cases. This is what we meant by the analogy of being. Let's go back to the cute little white dog who's smiling. Now the dog exists. The cute, the white, the little, and the smiling also exist. But they don't exist in exactly the same way. The dog exists in himself. But the other traits of cute, white, little, and smiling only exist in the dog. The dog might stop smiling, grow bigger, or change color, but he will still exist. But if we take away the dog, we have to say goodbye to all his accidents too. So substances like dog don't exist in the same way that accidents, cuteness, do. They exist in an analogous way, but not in an identical or univocal way. We'll talk more about this later. But God's being is different than Dr. Elizabeth Shaw's being. God has always existed and always will. But my existence is limited in time. So my being is somewhat different than God's. My being is analogous to God's being, but not identical. This, by the way, was Parmenides' problem. For him, things either existed or they didn't. He insisted on understanding being in a way that was univocal and made no room for substances and accidents or change and becoming. Number two, being is not a genus or being transcends everything. Why is this the case? Remember what a genus is. It is a class of many different species and individuals within species, all of which share something in common. For instance, mammals are a genus. What makes them mammals is that all the mothers of all animal species produce milk to feed their babies. Now what's outside the mammal genus? Any class of things in which the mothers don't breastfeed their young. See what I did there? To divide the mammal genus from everything else, I had to go outside the genus to find something common to all things outside. And the easiest thing to find is just to take away the one thing that's common to all members inside. So let's try that with being. Assume being were a genus. It would contain all things that exist. But what could be outside that genus? Only the things unified by the quality of not existing. And I don't think we'll have much luck finding things that don't exist. So being is just too broad, too all-encompassing to be a genus. It transcends the limitations of a genus. Okay then, what are the other transcendent features of being? That brings us to number three. Being is one. Or better said, being is a unity. We, we can see this in at least two ways. First, there's only one collection of all things. Yes, there are different genus, species, and different ways of being, but all things that exist share a fundamental unity in being. Being is the one quality that unites all of them. Second, everything that exists, exists a unity in its substance. Think of a tree. We can think of one tree, two trees, three trees, or even a whole forest full of trees. But a tree has a certain indivisibility to it. We can remove some branches, we can remove the leaves, but we still have a singular tree. If we ever try, however, to remove something that is truly essential to the tree and the substance that makes it a tree, we no longer have a tree anymore, but a stump or a log or a pile of wood chips. Even if we consider a thing that can easily be, be divided into parts, like an apple, we can see that the experience of half an apple only makes sense if the being of an apple is grounded in the reality of one whole unified apple. What else can we say about all things? Number four, being is good. Hmm. This one is a little less intuitive at first glance because while we experience good things, we certainly experience things that seem pretty bad, like tornadoes or cereal colors or strep throat. 
For now, let's content ourselves with Aquinas' explanation of this. Everything that exists is actualized as something. Every actuality is a kind of perfection that began only as a potentiality. An acorn desires to become an oak in the sense that because this is the actualization of its potential or the perfection of its purpose in the world. This actuality of becoming an oak is thus good since it is a desirable perfection. It's important to remember that by good here, we don't mean moral goodness exactly. We mean a kind of generic goodness in all things that exist, insofar as they exist. What else can we say about being? Number five, being is true. Ugh, this one is even harder to see than the idea that being is good because we tend to think of truth differently than Aristotle and Aquinas did. We can see pretty, pretty easily that this coffee cup is one. We can also see that it is good. But what would it mean to say that the coffee cup is true? For St. Thomas, truth is relational. It's when our idea of the coffee mug that's in our intellect corresponds correctly to the being of the coffee mug that exists outside of our intellect. Now we might not have a perfect idea of the coffee mug in our intellect, since we might not know who made it, what, it, what it's made of, or, or why it was made, but since the coffee mug exists in real being, its truth can be known to the intellect. So to sum up, to be means somewhat different things when we're talking about different kinds of being. Being transcends all individual things, all species, and all genera. The transcendental qualities of being uh, include oneness, goodness, and truth. Which is to say that when I say something exists, anything, it's always the case that that thing is one, that it is good, and that it is true. And that is very cool.